بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما تعلمنا وزدنا بفضلك علما وتعليما إنك على كل شيء قدير So our second <coughs> part of uh, how to get married in Islam We're going to go through the process So there's a number of steps uh, we could add to this, of course, but these are kind of just a rough thing. Uh, the first thing is the intention. So the intention of getting married. So number one, as we mentioned in the first recording, make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala your one goal. Pleasing Him, Him being content with you. That you meet Him on your muqiyama and you feel that you've done every single thing possible and impossible to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what we want. That Allah be happy with us now and in the, in the future. That's number one. <clears throat> number two, make him your one hope. What is you what are you hoping for in the future? What is your you know, what could you dream to happen? Right? What would you like to last forever? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And your own reliance. What are you relying on? On oh, my my wealth, my abilities, my looks, my whatever it is. My family connections only rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You lose hope in every single thing other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number three, intend to fulfill the Allah centric personal and Allah centric societal goals, as mentioned in the first recording. Things that you are trying to achieve for yourself for the sake of Allah, and things you're trying to, you're trying to achieve for society for the sake of Allah through marriage. And in Bukhari Muslim, the Prophet said, In the Mal Niyat, what you do is only worth what you intend by it. So your marriage is only worth what you intend by it. And so that's the most important thing possible. Second thing then is fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a tool a of the process, beginning, middle of end. Of one's marriage Fear of Allah I fear Allah I fear Allah's punishment I fear Allah's punishment I fear Allah's wrath I fear Allah cutting off All good in this life And the next for me So number one Resolve to keep to what is halal To keep to the rules of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala If it is haram I don't want to do it <clears throat> Realizing Realize that achieving Happiness through sin Is lunacy You're barking up the wrong tree you're insane. You cannot achieve happiness in this life or in the next life through sin. It's not going to work. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, enter houses through their front doors. You want to enter a house, here's the door. Go ahead. You don't go in the back door. Right? You want, you want something? Take the normal route that results in that thing. That's how, you, that's how we live life. We don't go around things. You go the proper way. And fear Allah the happily you might succeed. You want to achieve something? Go the right way through it. Um, keep a visual and emotional distance from the opposite sex. So you are try you're looking to get married. So now you do it in the wrong way. Checking out everybody, connecting with everybody. Wrong 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 keep a, a, a turn away. if you want to achieve something in life you turn away from that thing and turn to Allah that's how it works so keep a visual and emotional distance from the opposite sex and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you what you want turn away from it and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give it to you so keep a visual and emotional distance from the opposite sex until you find your potential spouse so lowering your gaze and not letting your emotions uh, uh, you know, having an emotional affair or emotional connection with somebody, you don't do that. Right? Don't do that. Don't graze. What does that mean? Meaning, oh, let's look at this person, look at that person, this person, that person, this person, that person. Wrong. Very bad thing to do. And don't flirt. Right? This is haram. And in Sahih Muslim and others, they narrate that the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah has destined a certain amount of illicit sex, zina, for every single man. And there is no escaping it. The illicit sex, the zina of the eye, is the lustful gaze. The illicit sex of the ears is listening to voluptuous song or talk. 
listening to somebody that you find attractive, you like their voice. Uh, the uh, the illicit sex of the tongue is flirtatious speech. The illicit sex of the hand is a lustful grasp. So it's not halal to touch somebody who you're not married to. A member of the opposite sex, you cannot touch somebody you're not married to. And the illicit sex of the feet is to walk to a place where he intends to commit illicit sex. The heart yearns and desires, and it is up to the private parts to put it into effect or not. Right. So this is very important. Right, this helps us understand, even going back to the goals. Oh, I need to be saved from the haram. Brother, you're already doing the haram. Sister, you're already doing the haram. Right? You're, it's not halal for you to look in this kind of way. It's not halal for you to talk in this kind of way. It's not halal for you to go and walk past these people to get their attention. It's not, it's not halal for you to try and do these things. Right? can't give a high five to the opposite sex you can't give a hug group hug that is not halal that's not, you can't do that right you can't try things out like it doesn't work oh i just want to try things out and see if this person you know this if we could this this makes sense you can't do that it's not it's not going to make you it's not going to make you happy in this life or in the next and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says and allah would make the burden light for you for mankind was created weak, right? Mankind was created weak. And so this verse is in general, it's talking about mankind in general. But what it's telling us specifically, the context of the verse is talking about the opposite sex. Mankind is weak when it comes to the temptations of the opposite sex. And that is normal, right? That is normal. That's not an individual. Oh, brother, I have this problem, sister. You know, I have this problem, like this is something unique to me. It is not unique to you. That is just normal. That is just the nature of people. So be very, very careful. Don't come and say, oh, you know, it's not an issue for me. That's not true. It's not an issue for me. I'm not, I'm not tempted. You know, I, I'm looking at this, uh, I'm watching this film and there's an attractive woman. And it's, not, it's not an issue for me. Right? You're, that, you're not being, that doesn't make sense. Right? You work with this man or you work with this woman who's obviously an attractive person. And normally you're and you're a heterosexual, so that's just that's just normal. So don't say it don't, so this is reality and so a man, you were created weak. Realize your weakness and take the proper means to fulfill and protect yourself from that weakness. Okay, so that's number one, fear of Allah. Finding prospective spouse. So a prospective spouse. So again, number one, the Allah-centric and personal and societal goals. I'm looking some, for somebody to help me fulfill these goals for Allah's sake. And, uh, and this, so I need somebody with specific criterion. Number one, a level of attraction. You're getting married. Marriage in Arabic is called nikah. Nikah in Arabic, according to many ulama, means intercourse. That's what it means. And so, yes, you can marry whoever you want. It doesn't matter what it is. And that's not the, necessarily the priority. But by default, you need to marry somebody that you are attracted to. And it's not a wise thing to do to marry somebody you're not attracted to. Because then you're not going to fulfill the, 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 what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking you to do. And you may well fall into major haram things. And so it is important, some level of, of attraction, right? You, 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 you ultimately want to sleep with this person, that you, you could envisage doing that in principle. And so that's an important thing. And so the, so the Prophet ﷺ, he said, O youth, whosoever among you is able to get married, let him do so. Why, O Messenger of Allah? Because it helps you lower your gaze. So if you are married to somebody who on no level at all do you find attractive, then it is not going to help you lower your gaze. And it protects your private parts, uh, 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 um, satisfying your sexual urge is a goal of, of, uh, um, of marriage. And so if this person is not attractive on any level whatsoever, and you could not have relations with that person, 
then it's a very unwise thing to do. A very unwise thing to do. And Imam Ahmad and others narrate them, the Prophet wasallam said, If you intend to pr propose to a woman, then if you are able to see from her something that will make you want to marry her, then do so. So notice here, the context is not, oh, find out if she's religious. The context here is not find out, you know, if you can t have a conversation with her. Here, the Prophet wasallam, the Prophet of Allah, is telling this man, you need to marry somebody that... You know, there's there's some level of attraction, right? See, right? Visual, that's important, right? And this applies to men and this applies to women. So, a some level of attraction is do they have to be drop dead gorgeous? No. Do they have to be the most uh, unbelievable person uh, in, in the world? No. But there has to be some level of attraction. Uh, make sure, number one, that they're not married. So now you're going around looking at this person and you don't even know if they're married or not. Can't do that. You're going around looking at this this person and you don't even know if they're engaged or not. Can't do that. You're going around looking at this person and you're not sure if they may be divorced, if they're still in a waiting period. You can't do that. You're going around looking at the, all these different people and you're not serious and they're not serious. This is a joke. Okay? That's not That's not reasonable. You, there's this person who is a reasonable match for you. You know that's the case. You know that she works in this shop. You know that he works in that section of the business. So you just sort of say, you know what? I'm going to go over there and just have a peek. Is that halal? That is halal. You can do that. But, right? Don't take the mic. Right? Don't. You gotta, it's got to. It's got to be serious. Right? Is it a real possibility? Honest to God, do you think she would marry you? No. Okay, then why are you even doing it then? Honest to God, is there any chance that that family would accept you? Like, no. Like, what are you talking about then? Right. So you have to be realistic. So a level of attraction, A. But B, prioritize religiosity. That is number one. Right. So there has to be religiosity. The person is religious. That's number one. But that doesn't mean you marry somebody who is super religious, but for example, deformed, right? So you're going to have to be on an unbelievable level of Iman, an unbelievable level of Iman, to marry somebody, if you are, for example, able-bodied and etc., and marry somebody who's deformed, right? Now, is that a good thing to do? That's a good thing to do. And if you're able to do it, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, go ahead. But most people, most people, right? Remember the verse, خُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ ضَعِيفًا that man was created weak, this will cause them unbelievable fitness. That they're married to somebody who has no arms, married to somebody whose has face is completely disfigured. They are not able to save themselves from the haram, and then they will do something ridiculous. That's not a wise thing to do. Right? That's not the advice of the Prophet. Yes, if you can do that, great. Right? But Otherwise, a normal able-bodied person should try and find somebody who's normal able-bodied and there's some level of attraction. But prioritizing religiosity. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, a woman is married for four things. Her wealth, her, state, her family status, her beauty, and her religion. These are things that happen. He's describing this is what happens. Make sure you marry a truly religious woman, that deen. She's got the deen down. She's truly religious. Otherwise, may you come to ruin. Right? And so you're looking for somebody, a man or a woman, and a spouse, who is, yes, there's, I, could, I could be married to this person. Right? I could be intimate with this person. A. B. And this is the priority. This person is religious. They're going to help me in my deen. They're going to help me pray on time. They're going to help me avoid the haram. If I make, make ghibah, they're going to say, hey, what? don't make ghibah, that's haram. Don't say bad things. They're going, to, they're going to, if I start doing the wrong things, they're going to guide me. And they're not going to make me do the haram. Um, and so in this context, we can compare just briefly boyfriend-girlfriend uh, qualities versus spouse qualities. Right, so let's look at a boyfriend material. Right, the guy's really cool. Um, 
right? It's not really weird or something like that. Uh, good looking, right? Emotionally compatible. You can connect with him. He's fun. He has some money to blow, right? He's not just sitting around, got nothing to do. He's like, let's go out on the weekend. He's going to do something, right? He's got wheels. He's got something, you know, and your friends like him. But these are often things that, you know, like, People be interested in that same person. Or every, all my friends like him. Uh, he's cool. He's good looking. It's like you're, you're naturally interested in that person. As a boyfriend. This is boyfriend material. Okay, well let's look at husband material. Number one, can you earn a living? Right? That's a very fundamental basic thing. Can he pay the bills? I'm not asking for diamond shoes. But can he pay the rent on a house and pay... And, and, and get up in the morning and go to work and earn a living. And if he loses a job, can you find another job? That's a, that's a very important thing. Like, a very important thing and a key questions to ask the spouse. Uh, what do you do for a living? He says, oh, I don't work right now. That's a huge problem. That's not a small problem. That's not seeking the dunya. Right? When you ask your potential spouse, oh, you know, about money. You know, I'm not talking about the dunya. I'm talking about... Functioning as a husband, right? Religious, you are the man of the house. Are you going to guide us to heaven or to hell? Emotionally compatible, can we even talk, right? Are we able to talk? Are we able to negotiate things? It's very important. Maturity, are you going to blow up every two seconds? Are you going to realize the reality of things, right? Do you understand life a little bit, right? Protective. Right? Is he conservative and protective physically and emotionally? That, for example, that he, uh, you know, or does he not care what kind of people you talk to as as a woman? Understanding, right? That's that's kind of goes hand in hand with maturity. But at some level of understanding this person, right? And it's many of these things, uh, they're not found in many people, right? So not looking for the perfect thing, but looking for elements of understanding and elements of protectiveness and elements of maturity. And elements of religiosity that we're looking for. Good looking. So you find this man utterly ugly. It's, by default, that's not a good idea at all. Right? Family oriented. Right? So the boyfriend is not necessarily family oriented. Oriented. Right? But for the for the man, that's that's not, that's super important. Right? If he's like, no, I'm just into my business. I'm just into my hobbies. It's like, well, you are going to build a tribe. Are you are you looking to that tribe or not? Right? Sexually conservative. How does he interact with women? Does he cheat? Does he have a girlfriend? Has he had girlfriends in the past? Right? And again, we'll talk about asking questions later on, but that you can get an idea. What is this person like? How does he interact with the opposite sex? Does he believe, for example, that it's totally fine? Um, for example, for, to intermix, to socialize, to socialize with women, right? So if he socializes with, with women, you, you have a bit of a problem, right? Like he's regularly like any kind of woman, just like yeah, he's he's you know, that, that's a problem. It's it's not going to work on the on the long in the long term. It's, it's going to have major problems, right? So we can revere women. Right? He, might, he might have a teacher, for example, that's a woman that he might revere. Or you could like, uh, you know, work with women. That's okay. But like, you have a she, he has a buddy that he hangs out with as female, or he you see how he interacts with females. It's like very very loose. This is not gonna help. This is not husband material. Right? He's buddies with your friends. So if you compare boyfriend material, right? It might be alright that he likes your friends and your friends like him. But it's not going to be alright on a husband on a husband material. It's not going to work out long term. He is a patriarch. He's looking to build a family, and 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 uh, uh, um, um, produce God fearing children who will produce God fearing children. This is what you're trying to do. He's trying. He is trying to be this. He's he's an Abraham. He's a walking Abraham. Alayhi salam. That's what we're trying to do. This is these are husband material. Right, husband material as opposed to boyfriend material. Girlfriend material, she's cool, she's good looking. So she's emotionally compatible, she's fun. 
she has some money to blow. I'm not going to pay for everything. Uh, your friends like her, right? She's not really weird, right? So when you go out with your friend, she comes with you and it's kind of cool. Like, you know, she doesn't like not be able to talk to them or something. That's kind of weird as a girlfriend. Okay, what about wife material? Maternal. She's going to be a mother. You are marrying a mother, right? Somebody has maternal skills. You're marrying somebody who's religious because she's going to be your companion and she's going to be the mother of your children. She has to be religious. Otherwise, you're going to make yourself irreligious and make your children irreligious. She has to be mature. She has to realize that we're not in Disneyland, right? There are difficulties in life. Not everything is as it was at home. Things change. Maturity is super important. Understanding. Good looking. Subservient. So you ask her to do something. Like, is it always an argument? Because if your what if your girlfriend doesn't obey, it's not the end of the world. Like it's a bit weird if she's like that. But for your wife, it's like, uh, yeah, well, obviously we're gonna cooperate as much as we can. This is not a you know slave and slave master relationship, but there is a hierarchy. And if like every two minutes it's an argument, and every two minutes that there's no such a such a such a thing as as authority, and authority is considered as a threat and as a problem, then that's 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 not good. Right? And it's kind of difficult to ascertain when you're meeting a spouse. But subservient, this is a major issue. Right? This is a major issue in the West, right? Let alone like in Islam, it's like people are kind of like sick of um, um, women who are just not, not like that It's kind of annoying Sexually conservative How does she interact with your friends? How does she interact? How does she dress? Right? All of these things Again, you find this against any traditional society Any traditional society will value these things Right? So you're not going to marry a woman Who is cheats on you on your wedding night you're not going to marry a woman who is showing her body off to everybody because it's, that's, it's not going to work in the long run again girlfriend material we're not talking about a long run it doesn't matter in fact it's kind of cool that everybody sees how good looking your girlfriend is but for a wife it's not going to work as a long term system so being conservative meaning you know how does she interact with the opposite sex? Uh, how does she dress in, in front of the opposite sex? Um, how does she, is she conservative in those things? That she doesn't have, for example, male friends. These are very important things, right? And so you, you know that, that that's super important for uh, you know wife material, and a matriarch, right? She is somebody who has this long term plan. I want to have, I want to get married, I want to have kids, and I want to have grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, and great-great-grandchildren, and the, my vision is that uh, this is, uh, like, just like you're trying to marry the Abraham, walking Abraham, I'm trying to work a, 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 um, a walking Hajar, radiallahu anha. Right? This is the mother of Ismail, the great-great-grandmother of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa right? I'm thinking about my marriage is the ship coming down on Mount Judy with Sina Noor. Right? Imagine getting married just after the ship landed. What kind of mentality would you have? That you want long term. So this is a matriarch, right? She's got a she's she's got a mind on her money and a money on her mind, right? Not in the material sense. She has a plan, she has a game plan, as opposed to I don't know what I'm doing. And so there's a big difference between a patriarch that he has a leadership mentality and he's leading the family to a long-term goal versus a tyrant. The tyrant is whatever I say goes and anybody who, who, who challenges me gets it. Right? These are two totally different things. Right? And similarly, the matriarch versus the little woman. The little woman does not have the long-term goal. She just is subservient, that's all. You tell her, make me a cup of tea, she does it. She says, my friends are coming at 10 o'clock, 
a.m. Please make some food. She does it. That's a little woman. We're not talking about that. Right? That is of some use and of some utility. But it's not. that's not what we're talking about. Here we're talking about a woman who looks at you and sees how she can worship Allah through you and is using you for a... And she has resolve. She has confidence. She has reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She has a, an aim. And she wants to support you as a husband to achieve those goals. And she's looking for you to lead her ship, right? And so let's make a comparison. A lioness versus a sheep. What does a lioness do? A lioness in reality is the head of the pride. She needs a lion for children. She needs a lion to help bring down major prey. But she and her, her the, the females around her, they have a plan. They're going somewhere. Right? And so this is very different. So a matriarch has a plan and is working with or, or, or arguably using the, the strength and supporting the strength and giving strength to her husband to achieve her long-term plan. And she's not a pushover. The wives of the process and them are not pushovers, right? Whereas the little woman figure is a pushover, right? So that's not, they're, they're two different things. So there's certain paradigms we have in our mind that are totally wrong. A patriarch is a chauvinist, wrong. A, matri uh, uh, a Muslim woman should be a pushover, wrong. That's, 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 not, that's not true. Now, with all that said, with all that said, there's a difference between making it halal and an Islamic marriage. An Islamic marriage, inshallah ta'ala, is as I have described. Making it halal is something else. Brother, I know exactly what you're saying. I really appreciate your long spiel, but I'm in a relationship. This is my girlfriend. She is not at all as you have described, but I'm not leaving this relationship and I just want to make it halal. Can I do that? Yes, you can. It is halal to just make it halal. You find somebody you like and you marry them. Here's my boyfriend. He said the shahada. Can I marry him now? Yes. Thank you very much. Is he what we described? No. Okay. But it's a marriage and you are now out of the haram and into the halal. Alhamdulillah, that's an achievement and that's something good and that's something beautiful. But it's not the same as an Islamic marriage. They're two different things. An Islamic marriage is much greater than that. In that context then, should you marry a non-Muslim woman? Right? Again, if you just want to make it halal, yeah, fine. She's Jew or Christian, you want to marry her, go ahead. Right? Or you're dating a... Uh, 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 a Jew or Christian and you just want to make it halal okay make it halal but is that an Islamic marriage are you looking at her as a matriarch as somebody who's going to help you land this ship of Noah and have many thousands of children and grandchildren and great grandchildren who are righteous people who will say la ilaha Allah Muhammad Rasulullah who pray five times a day and love the deen and spread the deen it's two different things right and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, he says, and permissible for you in marriage are chaste believing women. Notice the word chaste, right? Chaste. This is a very important concept because being sexually conservative, she doesn't flirt. She dresses properly. She doesn't socialize with men. This is a key thing. She doesn't cheat on. She doesn't have a boyfriend or, got, you know, these kind sort of things. This is a key thing in, in uh, for building a society. As well as chaste women of those given the scripture before you. So no, notice the language of the Qur'an. It doesn't say, yeah, you can marry a Jew or Christian. It says you can marry a chaste woman. So it's a very different picture. If you can imagine, you are, you are um, living in the Arab lands 500 years ago, and there was a major Jewish tribe or a major Christian tribe, and now you're making tribal connections with these people. And they are chaste, and they have an idea that, okay, we're going to have children, there's a long-term plan. They have the same kind of social structure as you. This is who we're talking about. As opposed to, yeah, well, I went to the West, 
or I grew up in this country and this is my girlfriend and I just want to make it halal. Is that what the Quran is talking about? No. Right? So it says, as long as you pay them their dowries in wedlock, i.e. the mahar, neither fornicating, meaning sleeping with anybody, nor taking as girlfriends. So notice the Quran mentions both of these things. There's three levels. Right? There is zina, right, or sifah, right, which is sleeping with anybody you want, right? What happens in that Las Vegas, right? That's that's one thing. And then there's your long-term girlfriend or long-term boyfriend. You're with this person for six months, for six years, whatever. This is also haram. Even if you are loyal, even if you're committed, this is also haram. The only way in Islam is through marriage. Right? And so when you're talking about marrying a Jew or a Christian woman, it's it's a very different kind of paradigm to be like, oh yeah, well, it's halal, so I can do it. No, it's like somebody who is chaste, she's from a conservative Jewish background. Like she wouldn't date you anyway. She's somebody who that you would meet through her father. Right? It's totally different. Totally different uh, system. So continuing with the process. Uh, we mentioned finding the prospective spouse, family. So, the family. The default is you and her, or you and him, are independent people. You are not marrying a family, you are marrying, marrying an individual. That is the default. And the default is you have the right to do whatever you want to do. And nobody has the right to tell you to, to do anything. That is the default, right? You are the man, you are the one getting married. You choose who you want to get married, and you choose when you get married, and you do your whole thing. That's the default. However, however, there are people around you, whether you feel it or not, that are emotionally invested in you. They care about you, whether you notice it or not. And so when you don't inv include your family members, you hurt a lot of people in very deep ways. They may not express their love to you. They may not be nice to you, but your family loves you. And so when you don't tell your dad and you don't tell your mum, whether you're a man or you're a woman, you're the groom or you're the bride, and you don't involve people, it really hurts them. It hurts them. And so involving people is very important. These people, again, whether you like it or not, that you're going to need their help. When the baby comes along and you need help, who are you going to ask for? When you die, leaving a two-year-old son, who's going to look after that two-year-old son? So you're like, oh, who cares? I'm independent. I can do what I want. Okay, well, you needed me, right? And respect, right? Where's the respect? And so we're not talking about halal and haram here. We're talking about living life. Is that, yes, you are independent and you can do whatever you want, but you need to realize the situation that you're in. You, real, you need to have people included. Right, make them feel that you spoke to them about it. You don't have to do what they're telling you to do, but you should listen to them and you should show that respect to these people. Right, and importantly for the bride, right, many or arguably most of the fuqaha of the scholars, they say that we need the permission of the bride, uh, the father's permission for the bride to get married. So you're going to go along and just do whatever you want. Yes, in def by default, you're an individual. You're an adult. You can do whatever you want. However, be careful. Include your father. Get his permission. And the default is he should be marrying you off. Right? He should be the one actually doing the contract. Okay. Thus, family. The more you include them, the better. All things being equal. Gathering information, super unbelievably important, right? So you're trying to find out about this person. Ask their friends. Ask their colleagues, right? So their friends like them. Their colleagues may or may not like them. Ask their teachers, right? Their shuyukh, right? Or their teachers at school, what was so-and-so like, right? Uh, their family. And put the information together, right? Usually what happens is you fall in love and then it doesn't matter, I don't care. 
or you talk to the friends and the friends are all for it right or well, the family is all for it it's not very useful you need to do do research and find out what's going on and it's better to do this way before you meet right because otherwise you've already met you've already kind of fallen for this person and you just kind of love is blind right it's not a clever thing to do um, there are certain questions that should never should be asked so you can get a concept right so you meet this sister and she's not wearing hijab and she doesn't wear hijab and her parent doesn't wear hijab you have an idea that she doesn't wear hijab and she's not going to wear hijab right you don't have to ask those questions right if you know the person from the past i was at school with you i saw you at college i worked with you i know what you're like then you know these things right otherwise you shouldn't go around asking questions so for example on your first meeting i have a question i'm sorry to be rude have you ever committed zina you should not ask questions like that you don't ask questions like that right you don't do that uh, uh, have you always prayed on time when did you, you know you don't ask questions like that you can get you can you can indirectly pick up this information that you realize this person is new to the to to the dean they you know they they're new to practicing the dean right you can you can find out these things indirectly but you cannot ask questions like how often do you smoke right you know uh you can't do things like that Um, you know, so you need to avoid certain things. Some of these questions you you never ever ask. You don't ask them when you're meeting that person, nor even if you've married that person. You never ever ask that question. Did you ever have a boyfriend? Did you ever have a girlfriend? Okay, now you found out that they did. Okay, did you ever commit zina? That's not a question you ask somebody. Right? You don't ask that person that, that, these kind of questions. And subhanAllah, some people, they're married, and then later on they ask these questions and it ruins their marriage. Why did you do that? Right? And so we have to be respectful. Uh, and you can get a picture from you know, other, other kind of questions, and that should be enough. Right? You don't need to push onto, you know, onto tender, you know, tender, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, you don't need to traumatize the person by like asking questions. Oh, excuse me. You know, uh, have you ever, you know, do a do a kind of like a psychological test on them, right? You, you know, you can get, you sh you can ask them like, you know, is there anything really important that I need to know, right? And then you could maybe they can tell you or tell somebody else, but you know, but you know, the the, the these are questions you shouldn't you shouldn't ask. Okay, gathering information, do that job and do it properly. Meeting. So notice gathering of information before meeting. Very important. So number one, get the family's permission. Do you need the family's permission? I'm not asking. I'm talking about that now. I'm talking about how to do it properly. How to do it properly? Include them. Include the family. Say, hey, I wanted to meet your daughter. Uh, is that okay? Right. Do it in the presence of righteous people. So that you will be protected from doing the haram. Or in public, you cannot meet alone. We cannot be meeting in, a, in a, an environment. You're meeting in a nightclub. You're meeting in a cafe where people are dating. It's not. It's not going to work. Uh, you're going to fall fall into the haram. Uh, only look at the face and the hands of the woman. You can't look at anything else. So, will you notice, for example, how tall she is? Will you notice the shape of her body in general? Yes, but you cannot look at the shape of her body. You can't do that. Right, and the same thing for a man, navel to knee. So you can you can look at his face, neck, chest, right, but belly button down to knees. You can't look at his thighs, for example, right? That's haram, right? Um, and can you look with lust? Yes, you can look with lust. Like, oh, I'm attracted. Oh, I'm attracted. Yeah, I'm attracted to this person. That that is the point of meeting. The point of meeting, right? When in is is that I see something as mentioned in the hadith I see something yeah, I, I, I like the way this person looks like I can imagine being with this person physically right uh, know what you're looking for so this is a huge problem you don't even know who you want to marry right so you need to know before the meeting what are you looking for right 
ask all questions. Take the time to ask questions. Don't be like, oh yeah, I've just fallen in love, that's it, this is the best person in the world. Ask questions, right? Meet more than once, right? It's quite difficult to like ask all questions in one thing. You know, it's not wise in general, it's not wise that the meeting was like this. Well, the, my family and her family were in the room together and we saw each other from the other side of the room and that was it. That was not, that's not very wise, right? Again, we respect all different cultures and it's halal to do that, right? And if that's how it works in your culture and her culture, that's fine. But generally speaking, that's not a very clever thing to do, right? You need to talk, right? Consider doing pre-marriage counseling. How many a time someone calls you up and they say, brother, I have marriage problems, like you should have done pre-marriage counseling, right? You should have done pre-marriage counseling. You should have uh, met with a counsellor, the counsellor help you through the discussions, help you ask the right questions, and make everything make sense, right, it's a very good thing to do, right, and if you're, if there is, no, 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 let's just get into, let's just jump into things, no, if you're serious, if you're serious about it, do it in the proper way, particularly if you have a troubled past, you have a troubled this, troubled that, whatever, or you're not sure, different cultures, different things, this is a good idea, right, uh, and then you can find out if he's going to pay for it or not, right? So he's like, oh, I don't want to pay for it. Let's do 50-50. It's a good, it's a good, way, good way to test out their prospective group. Discuss immediate and long-term worldly and religious plans. What are you planning to do? Oh, I'm, I'm doing my master's and my PhD, and then I'm going to travel to Mars. Okay, that's useful. Right? Oh, I'm going to try and make up my prayers. Um, I'm, I really want to go on Hajj like ASAP. That's what I want to do, right? What are you trying to do? Right? I'm working on memorizing Quran. I'm doing my Alim program. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. What What are you trying to do? Right? What are you, What are your long term, short term plans? Right? In your in the Deen and the Dunya. Discuss finances and living conditions. Right? Again, the people. Chances are this is on YouTube. Chances are the person listening to this is in the West. And you're going to marry somebody from a totally different culture. Everything is in flux. Everything is changing. There is no such thing as normal and standard. And so you need to talk specifics about finance, right? For example, as a groom, you ask her, say, how much money does your dad make? And how much do you spend on food? And how much do you spend on this, right? And she's like, oh, I don't know. Never even thought about it. That's relevant. The fact that, for example, she's not familiar with the budget and you live with a budget, or vice versa, right, you, you know, you live with a budget, or you don't live with a budget, you're asking, you know, did you, do you, do you, at home, do you live on a budget, like, when you go shopping, do you have a budget, or is it like, just buy whatever, right, does she have her own car, how many, what kind of car is it, like, how, what is normal for her, what is normal for him, living conditions, oh yeah, of course you're going to live with my mum and dad, we have to talk about those things, that's unbelievably important, right? Which country are you going to live in? How many times are we going to move, right? Very important to discuss these things. Share current lifestyles. What are you What are you doing right now? Like, how do you live life right now, right? Not theoretical, like realistically. Yeah, I wake up at 11 o'clock every day and I look for a job. Oh, interesting. So you're one of those kind of guys. Wake up at 11 a.m. and you look for a job. That kind of person you are, okay, great. As opposed to, this is what I do. I wake up at 6 a.m. and I do this, and I do this, I do this, I do this, I do this, right? I hang out with my friends at night until 1 or 2 a.m. and I come home. Okay, these are important things, right? So yeah, you might say, yeah, I'm willing to change them, but what are you doing right now? Right, what, right now. Discuss religious affiliations. Who do you like listening to? Which sheikhs do you like listening to? Who do you consider as authority? Are you Sunni? Are you Shi'i? Are you Sufi? Are you Salafi? Are you this? Are you that? Right? Talk about these things. Don't hide these things. Talk about them. Right? And then see how these things, okay, what does it mean to you? And uh, how is it, because these things are, are relevant. They're very relevant. There's no refund policy. So what does that mean? It means know what you're getting yourself into and commit to that. People change, but don't build it on chains. So the sister is not wearing hijab right now. 
what you see is what you get. The brother is not praying right now, but he says when he starts, when he gets married, he's going to start praying. Take him as he is. Don't take him as he isn't. He doesn't have a job right now. And he hasn't had a job for the last two years. Take that as it is. If you're comfortable with a husband who does not have a job, Bismillah. If you are not comfortable, there is no refund policy. You can't go back. It was very important. So take the person as they are. Okay, so we mentioned what? Uh, we mentioned uh, meeting prospective spouse, the decision. So after finding out what you are looking for, so then that's pre-marriage counseling. What? Who, who should I marry? Given who I am, who should I marry? The meeting, finding out all necessary information about the person. And more importantly, tone, turning totally to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and doing salat al-istikharas, doing the seeking good prayer, you come to a decision. Right? And remind ourselves, what you do is only worth what you intended by it. If you are getting married for the sake of Allah, and this comes exactly in the hadith, if you are getting married for the sake of Allah, then that's what it is. Right? And very importantly, every decision you make for a good reason is good, regardless of how it works out. So don't worry. If you've been married five times and, it, and it turned, every single time it failed, that's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. If you're scared of marriage because your parents are like this, or because that does, it's, so, it's totally irrelevant. Are you doing this for the right reason? Yes. Have you taken the steps? Yes. Bismillah. It's already good. It doesn't matter how it ends up. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Never would Allah ever let your good deeds, your iman, come to nothing. You've done good things with a good intention. It's going to come to nothing? No. How is it going to turn out? That's, that's for Allah to work out. But it is something good regardless. If you have your good intention, it is good regardless. Okay, your decision, the proposal. So, officially propose to bride family. Right? Again, inshallah, we've already invo involved the family, right? And so it's an official proposal. Now, nobody else can propose, can propose to her. Once they've pr proposed and they've accepted the proposal, no one else can propose to her. That's a very important process. There's no harm in following halal cultural practices, right? There's a whole shebang, a whole series of things they do in her culture or in your culture. That's totally fine. It's not a problem. It's not, you know, it's not bid'ah unless it is there's haram things happening in it, right? And many of these things have haram things and many of them don't, right? But whatever you want to do in your culture, these many of these cultures, you know, many of these things do reflect Islamic values and many of them don't, right? And so as long as it is, uh, you know, uh, uh, as long as it is halal, there's no harm in doing that, right? And it shows respect and shows these things. It's not, it's not a problem at all. Now, there's no meeting after... Uh, uh, unt uh, until after the contract so you have met this lady or you've met this man you now you looked and you like the way they look you're happy with it now it's haram to look because there's no need you've made the decision khalas you now get married in two months khalas you have to be patient right you can con you can communicate for practical things but you cannot flirt right you cannot talk in a sexual way and you cannot meet in a sexual way. This is all haram and this is stupid, right? This is a totally stupid thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving you a gift and you are tearing the gift up before it's arrived. Why would you do that? That doesn't make any sense. It's like you get a message from FedEx uh, delivery in two hours and you send a drone to bomb the FedEx. Like, Why would you do that? Why would you ruin the, the blessing that Allah is sending to you? It makes no sense. Okay, uh, the decision proposal, and now the contract itself. So we have, in the contract, we have four important people. The groom, uh, and the guardian, and two religious male Muslim witnesses. This is the ideal picture, right? Now, if we don't have the guardian, we could have the bride instead, according to many of the ulama. However, the ideal picture is we have the groom 
the man getting married, the guardian, her father or grandfather, or whoever it is, and two religious male witnesses that are going to be there to witness it. Uh, is it enough to have one male and two women? Yes, according to some ulama. Right? But we need to have witnesses. Uh, it doesn't have to be in a mosque. Right? So many people, they say, oh, you know, Imam Saab, I need to get married in the masjid. So you don't need to get married inside a masjid. Right? It's not a ritual. You don't need the imam and you don't need a mosque. Um, however, the Prophet ﷺ encouraged us to do that. He said, make marriages public, i.e. because you're building an empire. And this is the beginning of this empire, a tribe. Have them in mosques. Why? Because people are there. And beat the deaf, beat the, the daira, beat the drum when they happen so that people hear it and notice it. And so it's supposed to be public. So when it's just, you know, four people in a hotel room, it's a bit odd, right? Why was it so secretive? It's, it's valid, but, you know, uh, it, the idea should be public. As many people as practically possible. Beforehand, very important, they should agree on which madhab are you going to follow in your marriage? Or which legal system? Or which sheikh? Right? So we're going to say we're married on the Hanafi school, we're married on the Maliki school, we're married because uh, we're married following Egyptian law, we're married following Malaysian law, we're, mo we're married, and if we have any debate, any discussions, any anything about halal haram in our marriage, and in our and the, the, our contract, we're going to go to Sheikh so and so. Why? Why do you have to do that? Is there a verse of the Quran saying follow the Hanafi or Maliki school? No. Is there a verse of the Quran that says follow this or that? No. You can just follow Allah and His Messenger, right? True. But practically speaking, tomorrow when you have a, an argument or you have a divorce scenario, there are many issues of legitimate debate between the different madhahib, between different le Islamic legal systems, between different shuyukh and different maulanas. And so when you can't solve that and he's following one and she's following the other, what on earth are you going to do? So it's not an issue of this or that. The issue is of is avoiding hell when it's going to come later on. So you're going to say, for example, the sheikh that you both trust, you're going to say, uh, we are following him. He's what, The imam married us, and we're going to go back to the imam if we have any discussions in terms of rights, in terms of this, in terms of, we're going to go back to him. If there's a divorce case and somebody says it's a divorce, somebody says it's not a divorce, we're going to go back to him and he's going to, he's going to, we're going to arbitrate to him. Otherwise, it's chaos. Because 10 years later, they're having an argument, she goes to one sheikh, he goes to another sheikh, he goes to one country, Malaysia, she goes to another country, Egypt, and according to Malaysian law it says one thing, and that's legitimate in the Qur'an and Sunnah, and in Egyptian law it says something else, which is legitimate in the Qur'an and Sunnah, and we're both following Qur'an and Sunnah, but we cannot come to a conclusion about custody, about whether it's divorce or not, about this, about that. It's hell. So you don't want to have a situation like that. Agree in the beginning, we're going to follow the Hanafi school. Agree in the beginning, we're going to follow the Maliki school. In the beginning, we're going to follow uh, uh, Turkish uh, family law. Agree in the beginning, we're going to follow uh, Sheikh so-and-so. Any debates, we're going to Sheikh so-and-so. If he dies, we're going to so-and-so. If so-and-so. -and -so. It's very clear and you've protected yourself from hell 20 years, 30 years, 40 years in advance. Right? Be wise. Agree on the dowry. You do not have to agree on the mahar, on the dowry before the marriage. However, you should, right? You should do that. And if you're going to make conditions in the marriage, you should agree on those conditions beforehand as well. So the dowry is any amount that both sides agree on, right? Ten dollars, ten thousand dollars, ten million dollars, whatever you want, whatever floats your boat, whatever is you know, whatever is convenient. But it should be realistic. Right, realistic from both sides. Let's look at this guy. He lives in this country. This is his salary. These are the costs. Is that a realistic sum of money? Yes or no? Similarly, look at this woman. She lives in this country. She might get divorced. There might something happen. What's realistic? Right? So be a bit realistic. And you may agree to delay the payment. Many people do this. It's called mahar uh, mu'ajjal, which is where you say, for example, we'll pay, uh, the mahar is X amount, 
and will pay 10% up uh, uh, immediately and 90% in case of divorce or death. Right? That's called Mahar Mu'ajjal. You can agree on that as well. Now, conditions. The default as a woman is you have found Mr. Perfect. Again, he is your walking Abraham. He is the Prophet Sallallahu incarnate. Handsome, virtuous, trustworthy, following the sunnah in his character and every single thing. And you're like, I don't even care where I live with you. I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm just following you, whatever, right? You're the best guy ever. I will follow you to the bottom of the sea. I don't care. That's the default. But that's not realistic. And so, sometimes, often, we will be in a situation, particularly for the woman, where we'll have to be defensive. And it can also be for the man as well. Right? And so there's a big difference between a true Islamic marriage, which you're marrying somebody who you trust, and you have faith in, and you are hopeful that this is building a family, versus marrying somebody who you honestly don't trust. Or you trust to some extent, but not all the way. And so sometimes you can be defensive. I just give an example of that practical thing. Should you register the marriage uh, in a, for example, a non-Muslim country? Well, Islamically, why, what, that's got nothing to, why would you have to do that? Right? Why do I need a, a non-Muslim to ratify and confirm whether I'm married or not? Allah knows that I'm married. Okay, well, to be defensive. I don't trust you on with all you know, do all due respect. The fact that you don't want to register the marriage, I'm asking like, why? Turns out she's married, he's married. Whoa, <laughs> great. Right? Or defensive, the guy's a millionaire and he doesn't trust this woman. So I don't want to, I don't want to register the marriage. Tomorrow you're going to take me to court and get half my money. I don't want to do that. Right? So is that, you know, does that sound like an Islamic marriage? Not really. It's not a true Islamic marriage. Like, why would you marry somebody you don't trust? But sometimes that is the reality. You don't have a choice. You have a past. He has a past. You honestly don't trust each other to that extent. And you're going to have to be defensive. Or you just need that. You've gone through hell and back again. And you need certain conditions and certain protections. Otherwise, you couldn't get married. Like, I don't feel comfortable getting married. If I know, for example, my husband can take a second wife. I, I cannot do it, period. Full stop. So if that's the case, I'm not going to get married. Whoa. So now, that's not ideal, is it? You should marry thinking, I am marrying a patriarch. I don't care how or when or how he lives life. He is leading this, this family towards a sunnah, and I don't, that's fine. Whatever he does is great. But that's not always the case. And I don't trust him. And I, or I don't know that I can deal with that. So I need to stipulate these things. right? And so there's the bitter reality versus Islamic utopia. right? And there's just reality that this is the case. And I don't know how it's going to work out. And he doesn't know it's going to work out. And so we're going to have to you know, make these stipulations. So we may have to do that. So the contract then is very, very simple. Bride says, I hereby marry myself to you. Groom says, I hereby accept your marriage. Done. Married. Or the guardian or agent. So the guardian is like the father or the grandfather, right? Versus the agent, which is the person the wife puts as an agent, right? You are, my, you are uh, doing this contract for me. Right? So she might make her father do the contract for her or grandfather or somebody like that. Or she may appoint somebody else, you know, the imam, for example, make the imam her agent, right? her legal agent. Um, all she has to do that is verbally. I hereby make so-and-so my agent in marrying me off. Done. Right? So, this is, I, so he says, I hereby marry my charge uh, or uh, uh, my, uh, uh, the person I'm responsible for. So and so, mention her name to you, the person he's there. So and so. You know, you can add the name so and so as well. You don't have to, but make it clearer. And the groom says, I hereby accept her in marriage. Done. They are now married. Right? Very simple. They weren't in a masjid. There was no imam there. It's just the two people speaking and two male witnesses. 
uh, Muslim male witnesses. I hereby marry myself, the bride says, I hereby marry myself to you with the dowry of a thousand dollars. The groom says, I hereby accept your marriage with that dowry. Done. Or the guardian, uh, the agent says, I hereby marry my charge so and so to you with the dowry of this, and he says, I hereby accept uh, with that dowry. Done. I hereby marry you, uh, uh, myself to you with the condition that, for example, uh, 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 we stay in, in, in America. Or we stay in the, the place where my parents live, or whatever it is. I hereby accept your marriage with that condition. Done. Or I hereby marry myself to you with the condition that you never take a second wife. Or I hereby marry yourself, myself to you with the condition that I may divorce myself from you when I feel I need to. And he says, I hereby accept you in that, in that condition. Is that Islamic like marriage? No. This is the reality. This woman has gone through hell and back again and she needs that, uh, needs that, that, that condition. She can put that in there. So I hereby accept you in marriage with that condition. I hereby marry my charge so and so with the condition that such and such a thing, and I hereby accept her in marriage with that condition. Right? Now, that's the bare minimum. Ideally, there should be imam there. Why is the imam there? The imam there is not to bless the wedding. Right? The wedding is already blessed because it's for the sake of Allah. He is there to make sure everything is done properly. So he is the lawyer. The role of the imam is that he's a lawyer. He's looking at the law, the sharia is being applied properly. right? Similarly, he's there to record it. Now, as long as it's verbally said, that is enough. Now, but if it's done on a document, it's, it makes it much better. And that should be done. And there should be copies of it, etc. And also, when you're going to make a condition, agree on those conditions beforehand and contact a mufti and say, here, mufti sahab, this is the conditions I want to stipulate. Is this valid? Is this okay? Right? Because you're going to see some conditions yes, some conditions no. Right? There are details there. You should be aware of them. Before the contract, everything is haram. So culturally, many people don't understand the process. In their culture, they understand things in a certain way, which is not actually the deen. The deen is like this. You're either married or you're not. If you are not married, everything is haram. You cannot touch, you cannot look, you cannot flirt, you can't do these things. You can't dance with your with the bride but at the, but at the, at the, at the party before the wedding. That's haram. Right? You can't see her without hijab. You can't do these things. It's haram. Everything that is haram for any other woman is the same. Right? Before the contract. After the contract, everything is halal. So again, people culturally be like, well, contract, and then we have a party, and then this happens, and then that happens, and then we can be alone together, right? No. So in Islam, if you bumped into a woman in the middle of the street, and she said to you, I hereby marry myself to you, and I hear, and you said, I hereby accept the marriage, done. Within three seconds, you've shifted from haram to halal. That's how it is. That is all that's required, right? Offer an acceptance, Witnesses, that's all. And so that is what shifts everything. Now they can be alone together. Now they can hug. They, their mum, mother-in-law wants to take a picture of them uh, kissing, for example, kissing on the cheek, for example, or hugging or something like that. That's fine. Before the contract, it's haram to touch her. You can't touch her. Right? So a written contract is not a condition. Oh, we can't find the, the contract that we wrote. The, the contract is what you said. The written thing is a record of that. A party or a wedding is not a condition, right? So we have to call off the party. Is it halal? Are they married? Yeah, they're married. That's the contract happened, that's it. You don't have to have a party or a wedding. That's just extra. Informing extended family is not a condition. Was there an often offer and acceptance? Were the witnesses? Yes. Done. Oh, but the family doesn't know about it yet. So it's haram for them to sleep together. No, it's not haram for them to sleep together. Out of respect, it might be better to res show respect to the family and say, oh, that's how it's done in our culture. Okay. But otherwise, in terms of halal, haram. Halal, it's halal. But the Prophet is his advice was what? Make marriages public. Involve everybody so everybody knows about it. Have them in mosques. 
don't do things. So it should be as clear and public, as recorded, as observable as possible, and beat the duff when they happen. Okay, so that's the contract, and then consummation of the contract. Ad-dukhul. So what does it mean, consummation? Meaning you got married, and then what is the most basic right or shift that marriage allows is intercourse, right? And so the ulama, they disagree. What happens? What is dukhul? What does it mean when you consummate the contract of a marriage? So the marriage is valid. The people are married. This is husband and wife. Even if they're never alone ever in their life, it doesn't matter. They're married. However, upon consummation of the marriage, there's a shift in the rights and obligations and various other things. So the ulama, they debate, what does consummation of the marriage mean? Does it mean intercourse? Or does it mean being alone with the bride? It's a debate among the Sahaba and the Tabi'een, and to this date, it's debated. So again, this is why you have to agree beforehand which legal system, which madhab, which sheikh you're going to apply. I don't follow madhabs, fine. I don't follow any madhab, that's great. Which sheikh are you going to follow? This sheikh follows this position, this sheikh follows the other position. This is Quran and Sunnah, that's Quran and Sunnah. Which way are you going to go? Because tomorrow what's going to happen is you were alone, but you didn't have intercourse. And then it is a divorce, and then that will change, is it this or is it that? And then you're going to go back and forward and forward and backward because you didn't agree before the marriage. So agree. You don't follow a madhab, ahla masad, and that's fine. Follow a sheikh that you agree on, this sheikh that you're going to go back to. Okay, if he's not alive, we're going to go back to somebody else because you can't just follow neither nor. And so Sayyidina Umar, Sayyidina Ali, and others of the Sahaba, they said, when he closes the door, or closes the curtains, then she deserves her dowry and will have to observe the waiting period. What does this mean? Meaning the fact that they are alone consummates the marriage and now her dowry is in full and if she if he divorces her thereafter, she's gonna have to go to waiting period. Otherwise, what happens, as we'll discuss, otherwise what happens, they were never alone, or they never had intercourse, and they were never alone at all, then what, what what happens is she does not deserve her dowry, her full dowry, and there is no waiting period. She doesn't have to wait for anything. She just can get married the next day. So, about continuing consummation, intercourse does not have to happen on the first night. In fact, it doesn't have to happen ever in the marriage. Neither of the husband and wife are comfortable with intercourse for whatever reason. That has nothing to do with anybody. If we follow the position that intercourse is the consummation, that would mean something. But if we follow the position that as long as they're alone, it's irrelevant. So, so very important, people should not feel pressured that this has to happen on the first night. And if it doesn't happen on the first night, that means something about the marriage. No, it doesn't. No one else's business, it's, it's not an issue. right? Uh, uh, and there can be mutual agreement to take things as slow as possible. Again. The ideal situation is they should be alone together on the first night. Maybe they're not ready for that. Maybe they're not ready for that at all. Right? And so they might agree. Right? They say, listen. Uh, I'm, I'm, and it's not, I just can't do this right now. I can't be alone with you. Let's just, for example, travel together and be in separate uh, hotel rooms. Nobody needs to know. Family doesn't need to know. And this reduces ritual and emotional commitment. Meaning what? Meaning I'm marrying you, but I don't really want to commit that fast. So what we're going to do is we're going to get married. And then we're going to just like hang out. We'll date. Halal date for like six months. If that works, we'll be alone together. And consummate the marriage. When and how we both feel comfortable. If it doesn't work out, halas. You, the groom, the, the husband, you can just divorce me and that's it. The emotional commitment that comes with being alone and intercourse. And the ritual commitment, meaning now you're going to have to pay that there's going to be a waiting period. And now there's going to be the full dowry. I don't want to do that. I'm not ready for that. Like if that's what I have to do, I'm not going to get married. So that's not, again, Islamic marriage. But 
this is the reality is here I am this is who I am this is what I can do and I I'm, I can't do that thing so I will get married on that condition that yeah it's just we'll just go as slow as as we are as as possible that's totally fine so you do not have to live together after the marriage and you do not have to sleep together after the marriage you don't have to be alone together after marriage you can both agree just go as slow as you feel comfortable right these are all totally fine but it shifts the paradigm slightly after consummation so now you've been alone assuming that position or you have had intercourse and then there is divorce the full dowry is due whatever you agreed upon the full amount is due and now she the wife the wife is going to be in a waiting period she cannot get married for the approximately next three months okay and there's some details by default she's going to stay home in a place on at his expense for the next three months that's the default picture and if you divorce them before you touch them by right, intercourse or being alone with them after you after having had agreed upon a dowry so you agreed upon a dowry then they deserve half of what they agreed upon so ahmed and fatima they said yeah we'll 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 take things slowly after three months they said you know we can be together well let's let's be together tonight and they agreed for example on ten thousand dollars as mahar so then they slept together and the next day ahmed divorces fatima she gets how much ten thousand dollars before that they had agreed on ten thousand dollars but they had never been alone together and in that testing period he divorces her five thousand dollars right they reserve half of what has it, they've agreed upon so before consummation and then divorce half is due if the dowry is agreed that dowry was agreed upon we mentioned that was sunnah right you don't have to do that but no dowry is due if typo here no dowry was agreed upon they didn't agree on a dowry anyway they didn't even know what mahar was they got married and they have no idea what that is and then before they ever were alone together before they have had intercourse they either had a divorce no mahar is due whatsoever some financial assistance is also due and this again there's details here this is called muta'a not temporary marriage it's something else uh, some financial assistance is due as well and there is no waiting period because you have not slept with her and you haven't been alone with her so you just got married and you hung out you you did halal dating we went to coffee shop had dinner walked in the park and that's all that happened and then in that pro that time there was a, 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 a divorce she can get married the next day right somebody else and she doesn't have to stay home or anything so oh you who believe when you marry believing women and then divorce them before you touch them then there is no waiting period for them give them something give them some amount of money and let them go th uh, their way in a beautiful manner in a beautiful manner i divorce them and divorce should be nice right inshallah next week you get married and i'll come to you i'll, I'll attend your wedding inshallah right in a nice way as opposed to uh, anger and frustration all these kind of things so um uh with uh, now you may demand the full dowry before consummation so let's say for example that you mentioned in the beginning they they agreed to pay a certain amount up front and a certain amount in the case of divorce or death what if they didn't do that all right she's getting married and she says the, the dowry is a million dollars he's like yeah great so then they get married and she's like give me the million dollars and i will come to your hotel room or I'll come to stay the night at your house or I'll move in with you and he's like yeah well I didn't have the million dollars right now I mean I, I meant that I was going to pay it over the next you know he's like no we agreed on a million dollars as the mahar we did not agree that it should be delayed so therefore give me the whole sum now and then I will move in with you and he's like well that's ridiculous I don't have that so okay in which case divorce me and he divorces her and then what happens half of it is due right and so this is why things have to be clear because you in your mind you're assuming things that for example obviously i'm going to pay over the next 10 years or the next 20 years the next 50 years and that's not the case right and so things should be clear uh the mahar is ten thousand dollars two thousand up front 
8,000 to be paid over the next two years, or to be paid upon divorce uh, uh, or death, for example. Right? Things should be clear. So she has a right to demand the full dowry before consummation moving in. Now, she doesn't deserve it all, because there has no been you know, consummation, but she has a right to demand it. Say, I'm going to come and stay with you tonight. Before you give me, before that happens, give me the full dowry. Right? Now, financial assistance, again, refer back to your madhab that you agreed upon, the sheikh that you agreed upon asking the legal system because there's details here, right? And so you need to, it's, it's not as simple as just, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not that simple. So you need to, again, when you say, oh, I don't, I just, I'm just Muslim, it's like, that's great. You're just Muslim, that's good, you're just learning. But learn a bit more, you're going to realize there's different madhab, there's different opinions, there's different shuyukh, there's different legal systems, and there's differences here. And so you need to, uh, refer back to that that issue there. Okay, so that was the contract consummation, and the last thing then is the wedding feast, the walima. So this is a sunnah. The wedding feast is a sunnah. It is not part of the contract, and it and so are they allowed to be alone before the wedding feast? Yes. Are they allowed to have intercourse before the wedding feast? Yes. It's not even necessary to begin with. As you mentioned, the marriage is simple. It's just a contract. I hereby marry myself to you, I hereby accept you in marriage. Two witnesses, boom, done, finished, that's it. That's marriage. That's shifting from halal to haram. Right? But it's sunnah after the contract and after consummation to have wedding feast. To wedding feast. Right? Um, and to make food and share it with the family and community, and this is a sunnah to do, right? And uh, in Sahih Bukhari, the Prophet ﷺ told one of the Sahaba, he said, have a wedding feast, even if all you can offer is one sheep. I.e. you kill one sheep, slaughter one sheep, and cook its meat. If that's all you can do, that's great. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, make public marriages public, have them in mosques, and beat the duff when they happen. So the whole point of a walima is... Everybody knows that the two of you are married. And so in 20 years, when the discussion of whose child is what, everybody knows what's going on. It's very clear. We should be realistic. We should be realistic in the mahar and be realistic about weddings and every single thing. Realistic, realistic, realistic. People love to waste money. They love to show off. And they love uh, to do the haram. But the deen loves that it be realistic, that you get married, and that you do normal things that you can actually achieve. So don't do crazy things. You don't have the money. It's okay. I'll just take a, you know, take a loan. Take an interest loan. Why on earth would you do the haram for a son? That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. So do something realistic. How much can you actually afford? What are the expenses that are coming up next? Right? Be realistic. Right? And in reality, the, the, the strongest force in this dis discussion is the woman. Right? The poor guy just got married. He's going to say no to his wife when she's asking for this and this and this. It's pretty hard. Or the family is asking for this. If she says, no, 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 one second. I just want this. Right? Let's just get a few pizzas and that's it. Right? $200 thing and that's it. Right? She has the power, really, right? In, in that situation, the emotional power and the political power at that time. And so she should be mature and step in and say, hey, you know what, this is kind of unrealistic. Um, you know, this is this is what can actually be, this is a normal thing to be done here. And so this is what, these, these are expenses that are going to come up in the next year. And, you know, I don't want to have a husband that's never home because he's working five jobs. Like, I want to spend time with my husband, right? So this should be realistic and do something that's, you know, uh, doable. The Prophet Sallallahu when he got married to Safiya bint Hayyin, he made uh, her wedding feast dates, dried cheese and ghee. Some little stool-like humps were dug, so they didn't even have chairs, they just made them out of earth. And some people brought some leather mats. People brought dried cheese and ghee and they ate to their fill. So this is the son of the Prophet Sallallahu And who did he marry? He married a woman of status, Safiya. She was the daughter of the head of the Jews. Right? So she wasn't like just anyone. She was an important person. Right? Used to kind of somewhat high class living. 
And so it's like realistic, like what can you actually do? Here, like, so how many times have, have you been invited to a, a walima and somebody said, you know, um, you know, it's uh, 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 like a, they send out a Google sheet for people to, you know, to add what they're going to bring. Nobody does that, right? Because we're not realistic. We are not, we are, it's, we, we want this per person who is now spending money to spend more money, right? And make a scene and do these kind of things. This is not realistic. What it should be is that, yeah, mashallah, brother got married. Okay, what what do what, what you need me to bring? Oh, can you bring uh, a few chickens? Sure. Can you bring like uh, five salads? Great. Or could you bring, um, we need chairs. Okay, yeah, I'll hire the chairs from the local, uh, you know, uh, whatever, masjid or something like that. Practical, doable, and included. It should feel that everybody's there. This is the picture, not something ridiculous that it costs more money than he's ever seen in his life. Right? So that is the uh, picture of the process. We looked at the intention and fear of Allah. Notice how important these things are. Finding the prospective uh, spouse, the family, involving the family, getting in, gathering information, then meeting, then coming to a decision, then a proposal, then the contract itself, then the consummation of the contract, and then the wedding feast. So, inshallah, we saw those things, and then we're going to continue with how to get married with the other sections of this recording. Inshallah ta'ala, subhanallah wa bihamdik, ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant, wa astaghfiruka wa atubu